Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the Big East Rewind. I am your seven-foot host from Villanova, Chuck Everson, and my partner is the Michael Jordan of dentistry. They both wore number 23. Mike was known as Air Jordan, and Sonny is known as Sweet Air Sparrow. You know, so you see what I did there, Sonny? That's a dental joke, all right? That's a very good one. Sweet, I, sweet Air Sparrow. He's root canal royalty, and he held Jordan scoreless at the Dome. He's the doctor, the sensational Sonny Sparrow. How are you, son? I'm not as good as that intro, but thank well, you, man. Listen, I, I, you know, I, I, we've talked about this. I worked long and hard at this stuff. I took at least five minutes to put that together for you. See that? And we got to tell we got to tell our guests that we're professional journalists. You know, <laughs> well, so. <laughs> listen, he he is the big time. We could maybe learn something, Sonny, from you this think? guy today. I think so. <laughs> I think so. He's done. Listen, if if the show would be over, if I told you all his accolades on one thing, they, they would say thank you and good day. That would be it. It would be done. That's my kind of guesting. <laughs> so without any further ado, we got another Hall of Famer with us, Sonny, another Kurt Gowdy winner uh, yeah. in the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, along with numerous other Hall of Fames. We've had five other guys to win this award. So is our sixth Kurt Gowdy Award winner on the show, which is pretty cool. Um, we don't mess around. We do not mess around. Uh, he's a renaissance guy, son. He's done everything from play-by-play -play to, to uh, college basketball shows and golf shows on Sirius XM. He was on the Sports Reporters, if you remember that show. With I Mike do remember Cooper. that, yeah. I remember that. That was a great show. Yeah. And Dick Schaap also was on that show. Yeah. Yep. He worked for the great Bob Woodward at uh, the Washington Post. He's New York Times best-selling author. And he's got his, his next book. His current book is out right now. Uh, Federer, about the life of David Federer. We'll get into that with them too. The legendary sports journalist and storyteller, Mr. John Feinstein. How are you, John? Welcome to Chuck, the show. I'm well, and I am your six feet standing up very straight guest. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we have a big thing. You know, we, Sonny and I go back and forth about the bigs and the guards. That's kind of our, our thing. Sonny was a 6'5 point guard until some guy named Pearl showed up, and then he was a 6'5 shooting guard. So, <laughs> then there's some reason I was no longer a point guard. <laughs> some guy, imagine why some guy named Pearl Washington. Point for oh, Pearl. <laughs> <laughs> yep. So, uh, yeah, so that's and, – and so we've been doing this for a couple of years now, John, and we've had a lot of your uh, compatriots on, including our good friend Hoops Weiss, and uh, I want to thank him for putting us in touch with you so we can do this. So thanks for sharing yeah, your thank time. You. Today, Glad buddy. to be here. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start. Let's start out and, and talk about what you got going on right now. You got the you got the Faraday book that just came out, right? Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys are golf fans, but David Faraday is one of the most fascinating people I've ever met in sports. Uh, I've often said that the two funniest people I've ever met are Jim Valvano. Uh, who, whose death is now 30 years ago. Hard to wow. believe. Can you believe that? Uh, and David Faraday. David grew up in the Troubles uh, in Northern Ireland. Um, turned pro at 17 when he was a five handicap, which is good for you and me, but not good for a pro. Uh, worked his way to the European Tour, became a very good player, won five times over there, played on the Ryder Cup team in the famous War by the Shore, and beat Payne Stewart, who was the U.S. Open champion yeah. at the time in the single. Remember that. Uh, injuries and alcoholism eventually ended his career. But uh, Gary McCord overheard him telling stories in the locker room one day and said, this is the funniest person I've ever heard and asked him to sit in the tower with him the next afternoon after David had missed the cut at the inter old international tournament. And CBS ended up hiring him. David tells a funny story that uh, when two guys, he was sitting in a bar in Akron at, at the old World Series of Golf, and as he said, he was drinking vodka and Gatorade because he was an athlete. And two guys from CBS, Rick Gentile and Lance Barrow, introduced themselves. And he thought, oh, God, 60 Minutes is doing a thing on uh, athletes with drug, excuse me, drug problems. But it turned out they wanted to hire him. And he became a star right away at CBS because of his sense of humor and his insight and the trust players had in him. Even Tiger Woods liked him. Tiger Woods doesn't like anybody. Uh, and then went to NBC and now is with it with live golf getting paid a lot of money. So and unlike a lot of the guys who went to live who said, oh, I'm doing this to grow the game of golf and all that. David said, I'm doing it for the blank and money. Uh, so at least he was honest about it. And 
He's had real tragedy in his life. He had a son who died of an over drug overdose. Uh, mm -hmm. He's had great moments in his life, as I, I mentioned, and uh, married with uh, two surviving children, uh, all of whom I interviewed for the book. And it was a, it was a fascinating book to do, Chuck. Thank you for asking me about. Yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. He's, absolutely. He's a fun he's a fun guy to listen to. He, oh, he, he is. does have a great take on things. Oh, so genuinely funny. And uh, I got close to him because. Tom Watson and I ran a charity golf tournament for ALS research after Tom's caddy, Bruce Edwards, uh, who was right. also a good friend of mine, passed away from ALS. And David and Tom are very close because Tom, who's an alcoholic himself, helped David deal with his alcoholism. Oh, wow. Not that you're ever cured, you're, you're right. in recovery or not in recovery. And uh, so David would come and be our speaker uh, every year. At, the, at this dinner and and people would literally be falling on the floor laughing at him um, because he's so funny. And, and in fact, Steve Bashotti, the owner of the Baltimore Ravens, who always played in the tournament, um, told me he'd give the charity $50,000 if David would come and speak to his friends before a Ravens game. And I asked David if he would do it. He said, of course, $50,000 for the charity. Absolutely, I'll do it. And flew in, did it. And uh, his best line that day, it was right before the Ryder Cup in 2008, uh, he said, Europe has a problem next week because Nick Faldo was going to captain the European team. And he said, there's a big problem because Nick has to fly home to London to be present at the birth of his next wife. <laughs> so yeah, that's David. Yeah, that'll shake a few. That'll shake a few straws. Yeah, yeah. No, it was, it, 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 they were like you guys. They kind of hesitated and then went, oh, wait, that's really <laughs> pretty good. That's pretty good. So, so let me ask you this, John. We will let's start out. You come from a very musical family. You know, your father was big into music. Your mom was, and and you wind up in sports. How does that happen? Yeah, my parents asked that question for many, many years. <laughs> I uh, bet they did. In fact, I had it. My dad was running the Kennedy Center uh, when right. I was in college, and uh, I had a professor at Duke named David Pallets. And one day, as I was walking out of class, he said to me, "Are you related to Martin Feinstein?" because I was sports editor of the student paper at the time. And I said, well, yeah, he's my dad. And he shook his head and said, he must be so ashamed. <laughs> and, um, so the, but the answer to your question, Chuck, is I don't honestly know. I, I've often said that my father passed his passion to me, right. but I directed it to sports, whereas he directed it to the performing arts. And so we're both very passionate about what we do and, and what we love. Um, I, my dad's passed away. He was that passionate. Um, but uh, I was always a little jock. Uh, I, I played everything, you know, grew up in New York City yep. and played everything in the schoolyard. Uh, when I was a freshman in high school, uh, I, I knew I was going to be the next Walt Frazier um, until my, the swimming coach at my school pointed out to me that I was five four, foot four inch white kid um, and not likely to get a college scholarship, uh, even though I could really guard. Um, but, uh, he thought I had potential as a swimmer. So I became a swimmer and ended up going to college as a swimmer. And I'm, I've always been grateful to him. Uh, I still swim in master's competition and 13 and a half years ago, um, doctors discovered a bunch of blockages in my heart. Oh. And I said, that's impossible. I'm working out four days a week. I feel great. I don't have any symptoms. And they said, no, we know that your heart's very strong. Your arteries are a mess. If it not for your swimming, you would be dead. Wow. So I called my old swimming coach that day and thanked him for saving my life. Wow. Oh, there you go. That's so you, you, you mentioned the professor at Duke. So we, we got to go into the Duke now. Um, <laughs> much as we really don't want to talk about Duke, you know, but it's, you, you brought it up. So we have to go there. During your time at Duke, was that, was that the Jay Billis time? Where, oh, God, no. I wish. <laughs> no, I was I was pre Mike Shashevsky. Right. Oh, uh, you had the dark four, days. My four years at Duke, which is why I laugh when people like you roll their eyes. Um, Duke was ten and fifty six in ACC play. Yeah, there was a dark day. I know. Last yeah. or tied for last in the ACC all four years that I was in school. The year after I graduated, the nineteen seventy eight team. Can't remember who they beat in the Elite Eight. Uh geez. Um, you might want to ask Whitey Rigsby. But uh, oh, okay. they went to the national championship game and lost to Kentucky. And at the Friday press conference, Bill Foster, who was the coach at the time, who was a terrific coach, Philadelphia guy, um, and, and had a great dry sense of humor, 
was asked, how do you go from last in the ACC to the final four? Well, the answer was they had added Gene Banks and Kenny Denard to Mike Jaminski and Jim Spinarkle. Yeah, there you go. Bill, Bill just looked with a straight face and said, well, John Feinstein graduated. And everybody's looking around the room. Who the hell is John Feinstein? I was a 21-year-old police reporter at the Washington Post at the time, and I got to go to the final four because Duke had made it after being so bad for so long. But um, yeah, uh, the, the program stunk um, when I was there. And then Bill rebuilt it. And then Mike had two rough years out of his first three. And then you all, you know, you guys know what happened after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Tom, you mentioned it. So talk about, you, you get, you get started in, in the, in the uh, Washington post working with Bob Woodward, right? right? What was that like? I mean, that guy, that guy, I, just from the stories you hear about him, I can't even imagine working with him. What was that like? John? It was like getting a PhD in journalism every day. Uh, I, I, I've known Bob now for 40 years. I, I, we're still good friends. Uh, I was just at his 80th birthday party a couple of weeks ago and honored to be one of the invitees. Um, but Bob was the best reporter I ever met uh, by, a, by a wide margin um, because he, he knew a story when he saw it. And one of the things Bob taught me early on, uh, which I sort of followed as a mantra throughout my career, is you don't have to be rich and famous to have a story to tell. You don't have to be president of the United States. You don't have to be uh, Mike Krzyzewski or Tiger Woods or Tom Brady or, or anybody else you might care to mention. Um, but you, it, many people have stories to tell. And, and, and the, the lesson he taught me that way firsthand was when I was the police reporter, I wrote a three paragraph story one night about a car crash in Northeast in which three people had been injured. And I came in the next day and he said, you know, there's a hell of a story in that little short you wrote last night. I, I went, what are you talking about? He said, what was going on in those people's lives at 2.30 in the morning when they collided because one guy had crossed the divider and hit the other car? And he, what, what was happening in their lives? Go to the hospital, see if you can talk to them. Well, in those days you could just walk into a hospital and say, what room's Chuck Everson in? He's in 612. So I went to the hospital and as it turned out, the guy who had crossed the divider was a Howard University law student who'd been pulling an all-nighter because he had an exam in the morning and decided to go home and take a shower, fell asleep at the wheel. The other two people who were hit were a couple who had just found out that she was pregnant with their first child. And they were driving to Baltimore to be their first thing in the morning to tell their parents they were going to be grand grandparents. Thank God the child survived. But the story ended up on page one because people, you know, we all have things that happen in our lives and we can relate to something like that. And I learned that lesson early on from Bob. And, you know, I, I wrote a book on the Army Navy football rivalry. None of those guys played in the NFL. I wrote a book on Patriot League basketball. None of those guys played in the NBA. Uh, and, and yet both books were bestsellers. And I think it was because those kids had stories to tell. Yeah. So you got you, you talk about Bob Woodward. Do you, you want to fill us in a little bit on the deep throat situation? Do you want to give us any? Well, I mean, everybody knows now it was Mark Felt, uh, who was very high up in the FBI. Uh, it was funny because I, I was teaching a class at, at, at Duke years and years ago, and I got Bob to speak to the class. And one of my kids said, well, who's deep throat? And then Bob said, I'm not, I'm not, he actually asked it more cleverly than that. And Bob said, that's very clever, but I'm, I'm not ready to reveal who deep throat is. And I said, Bob, you said you'll talk about it when he passes away. And Bob said, yes, I will. And the kid who had asked the original question said, has he been sick lately? <laughs> <laughs> and uh it's a good follow-up yeah no, and, uh, and bob said you've taught your kids well <laughs> and uh That's great uh but uh we all know now that it that it was mark felt and bob actually wrote a book called felt after it was revealed who deep throat was wow so you're a guy now that's wrote what 45 is it 45 books it's john 48 now but 48 close enough. I, we came and came and keep track um What's your process, you know, as you get into a, as you get into a story and, and something that you want to talk about, or, you know, do you, you find your subject matter? Do you decide beforehand? Is it going to be a fictional story? Is it going to be a biography? Tell them, take us through your process and how that works for you. Well, there are two separate kinds of books that I write. There, there's fiction. Yep. Uh, I've done kids fiction for, gosh, I guess, 17 years now. I've done 15 
uh, kids mysteries, all set in the sports world in, in, in some way, shape or form. And in fact, um, one of my co-heroes uh, in the first six books uh, is a kid named Stevie Thomas, who is from Philadelphia. Because mm -hmm. Phil, I'm not saying this because I'm on with you guys. Uh, Philly's my favorite sports town. Um, nice. I, I laugh at people here in Washington who make fun of, of Philly as a sports town because Washington is a town full of front runners. You know, when the, the local teams are winning, everybody's on the bandwagon. Philly fans are fans, period. Um, and the Palestra is still the best building there is in college college basketball. That's so, that, not to uh, cut you off, John. That's Sonny's favorite place. I don't I don't think he's ever won a game there against us. Huh, that's Palestra. like that's like <laughs> it's not nightmare. That's his favorite win, place. John. What was um, that? Not an easy place to win. No, uh, as not a at all. Team. Uh, but I, I love the Palestra. In fact, my wife often says that if I ever disappear, she'll send the police to look for me at the palestra on the concourse underneath the, the famous sign because she'll she assumes that's where i'll go you'll, uh, you'll be right you'll be right next to jimmy hoffa's body right isn't that <laughs> somewhere to maybe right you know the rutgers band the first game they played in the meadowlands uh formed an arrow and pointed it toward one direction of the station stadium and spelled out hoffa um, so <laughs> <laughs> only in new jersey <laughs> i love that story yeah. uh, but um uh, you know, so I, when I'm writing fiction, I really rely on the reporting I've done through the years um, to, to make, the, make the fiction sound real. I, I've set uh, kids books at the Final Four, at the World Series, at the Super Bowl, uh, at, at the Olympics, all, all events that I've covered in my life. Uh, so I, I, I hope I make them feel real. Uh, Nonfiction is different, of course, because that involves a lot of reporting. And, and with the Faraday book, it was pretty simple. I'd known David for years. I knew he was a great story. And when he was willing to do the book with me, uh, I jumped at the chance. Uh, Season on the Brink, which was my yeah. first book. Uh, the funny story is, yeah, I, I know yeah, Bob Knight, me. I'd covered his Olympic team uh, and uh, went to him in 1985 at the Final Four, the one Villanova won, Chuck, you might remember that. I heard of that, yeah, there. I heard of that. Oh, God. <laughs> um, he, I, I was in, he invited me to a dinner with all of his buddy on Saturday night, because those were in the days when the Final Four was still played at a reasonable hour, and you were out of the building by eight or nine o'clock, even if you had to write. So after dinner, I, I had, to, because Bob had invited me into his inner circle, and because I'd been out there for a couple of days during the season and he'd let me in the locker room, practice, anything I wanted, really, I had this idea, what if I could do that for a whole season? Uh, maybe there'd be a book in, in that. And so I asked Bob if we could talk and he said, yeah, come on back to the room. And he was rooming with Pete Newell, who was his, one of his great mentors. Yeah. And Mike Krzyzewski was there because they were doing a clinic the next day. And they had to talk about what they were going to do at the clinic. So when they finished that, Bob turned to me and he said, what can I do for you, John? So I said, well, I had this idea, you know, I came and hung out with you for a couple of days during the season. Next year is going to be a big year for you. He had told me he was going to recruit junior college players for the first time, and he might even play some zone. And I said, I know it's going to be an important year for you. And I, if I came and hung out all year, I think there might be a book there. And Bob said, have you ever written a book? And I said, no. He said, do you have a publisher? I said, I didn't think there was much point getting a publisher until I talked to you. And he said, well, that was a good thought. And he said, if you can get a publisher, come on ahead. So Krzyzewski and I walked out the door. As soon as the door shut, Krzyzewski looked at me. He said, are you out of your blanking mind? And I said, well, what, what are you talking about? He said, you're volunteering to spend a year with him? I said, you played for him for four years. He said, yeah, I needed to go to college. Last I looked, you've gone to college. And I said, well, you worked for him. He said, yeah, I needed a job. Last I looked, you have a job. I said, well, I'll probably never get a publisher anyway. Well, five publishers turned the book down. Wow. And finally, I was offered a, an advance of $17,500, which was a pretty major pay cut from what I was getting paid at the Post, because I had to take a leave of absence, obviously. But I wanted to do it. So I went and did it. And to Bob's credit, he never backed away from my access, not once during the entire season. And the result was season on the brink. I, I have to ask you about that because I actually read that book. I couldn't find it in my in my on my bookshelf. I was trying to find it. That was the first book I read of yours, which I'm glad to hear. Was oh, so because it was the first one I wrote. <laughs> glad to hear that. Um, so I read it, and then I went to the final four when they uh, obviously are playing Syracuse in the finals. Right. And my dad and I both read it, and we went, and he said, "Well, if John's right, 
then you want to play Bobby Knight on the second night when he has less time to prepare. So we were figuring out all the ways that Syracuse was going to be at the advantage, right? And then, of course, it ends the way it does. But I, I did want to ask you. Probably should have won the game. I know that. Let's, let's, I mean, there's another, you, you're throwing daggers at me right here. I'm, man. I'm, sorry, I'm saying your, your theory was right <laughs> about playing them on the second night. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, you, it sh- but you know, on, on, on the other side, I wanted to ask you as that season ended and you finished the book, did your relationship maintain? I, I heard that, that maybe not. No, um, we were fine throughout the season. Um, and, but I knew having spent an entire season with him that when I sent him the book, which I did a couple weeks before publication, cause I wanted him to have it before it was pub, uh, he was going to find something not to like that's Bob, Bob, Bob was never going to call me and say, oh, you did a great job. That's just not who he is. That's part of his control thing. Uh, and so, but I was surprised. I got a phone call from Royce Waltman, who was one of the assistants at the time. And he said, John, this is your official phone call. Um, coach is pissed. And I said, yeah, okay, no surprise, Royce. What's he, what's he pissed about? Well, you were supposed to leave his profanity out of the book. And I said, no, seriously, Royce, what's he pissed about? And he said, no, that's it. And I said, well, first of all, Royce, it's not exactly a scoop to anyone that Bob curses. And yes. secondly, we never had that agreement. In fact, of course, Royce wasn't there, but... He and I had had a conversation at dinner one night because I jokingly said after a particularly profane pra- practice, this is going to be the first sports book that's going to come wrapped in a brown paper wrapper. And Bob laughed and he said, well, you're not going to leave all my profanity in, are you? I said, no, Bob, because I want the book to be shorter than War and Peace. But you understand <laughs> that a book about you without the word rhymes with luck and duck would be like a book about you without the word basketball. It can't be done if it's going to have any credibility at all. He said, oh, I understand you. But the thing you have to understand about Bob, and I know this because I was married to a pathological liar for 18 years. He's a pathological liar. He believes what he's saying. I, I never doubted that he honestly thought that I was going to leave the profan- his profanity out of the book. But there, there was no way that was going to happen. And he, he should have known that. And I think eventually he figured it out because eight years, eight years later, that's all it took. Uh, he walked up to me in a hotel lobby and started talking to me as if nothing had ever happened between us. You know, his, his coaching, good style, to hear that. <laughs> his coaching style, John, now that you're saying that the way, you know, his language and all that, that was nothing new to Sonny and I either. I mean, at that time, that was, stuff. Oh, yeah, 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 that was okay. You, you, was you've been coach, around the both of our coach coach. I ever knew who didn't curse was Dean Smith. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That, I believe that. Um, but I, well, how do you think he would hold up with his coach, with the way he coached now? You couldn't even do it, right? With social well, media. needless to say, Chuck, I get asked that question a lot. And if he coached today the way he did in the 70s and 80s when he had his greatest success, no, he, he couldn't succeed. But I believe great coaches adapt. I yeah. believe great coaches figure – Mike Krzyzewski went to his first Final Four in 1986, his last in 2022. He wasn't the same coach in 2022 that he'd been in 1986. Right. And I, I, I believe that a great – Bill Belichick's not the same coach today that he was uh, when, he, when he coached the Browns in the 90s. Um, mm-hmm. But I, So my belief is that Bob would have adapted because the thing Bob hated the most was losing. And he would not have liked to lose. You know, when he went and coached at um, Texas Tech in the early 2000s, he was there till 2008 – which is 21 years after his last national championship, he was successful there at a non-basketball school because he did uh, make changes. I mean, like I said, you know, the year I was there, he played some zone, even though he denied it when somebody asked him about it in a press conference, it was very yeah. funny. But uh, uh, so could he have coached the way he coached in the 1980s? No. But do I think he would have tried to coach the way he coached in the 1980s? No. Yeah. John, I want to ask you a couple of questions about the Big East, when the Big East came about and how it started. But first, I want to ask you one question. I know you're a great storyteller. Can you share a story about my beloved coach, Coach Jim Beheim? Can you share, share a story? I had quite a few, actually, uh, Sonny, if we had the time. But uh, my favorite story about Jim, uh, and, and he laughs at it now. In 1991, I was working for the short-lived National Sports Daily. 
And the day before the tournament started, Frank DeFord wanted me to write a story um, listing the eight best game coaches in the tournament and the eight worst game coaches in the tournament. Well, I picked Knight first among best, and I picked Dick Tarrant of Richmond second. And I picked Jim as the worst game coach, which, I, and I've written this, probably the dumbest thing I've ever written in my life. But the way Syracuse played and you know, they turned the ball over a lot because they were always up tempo and things like that. It was sort of an easy pickings type of thing. And the day that I was in uh, College Park for the first and second rounds and the day of, of the practices, Jim walked on the court, stalked over to me and said, you don't know a damn thing about basketball. How can you write that? I'm a very good game coach. And, and, and I, you know, I said, Jim, you know what? You're probably right, but what the heck? So, and one of the things you know about Jim, Sonny, is he, he, he's not a grudge holder. I mean, he ended up coming and playing in my charity golf tournament, the one I mentioned with Ferity, yeah. uh, every year and bought stuff at the auction and couldn't have been nicer to all the different uh, people who paid to play. But the next night, as you might remember, they lost to Richmond. And it was the first time a 15th yeah, seed two ever over 15. Two yeah, teams. yeah. Another, another dagger, by the and, way. Yeah, sorry. And it was, it was the late game. And so Jim walks into his press conference, it's after midnight and I'm standing over on the side and he sees me and he walks over to me and he says, you know what really pisses me off about this. Now people are gonna think you know something about basketball. <laughs> and it, honestly, we still joke about that um, to, to this day, but uh, Jim has a hidden heart of gold. Um, people yeah. don't see it all the time. Uh, I had a chance to yeah. see it. You probably knew Rob 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, who was his agent for years when Rob was dying of cancer. Jim went and saw him at the hospital on multiple occasions. And of all the coaches Rob represented, and he represented quite a few, the one who showed up at his funeral was Jim Behan. So uh, I, I have a warm spot for Jim. And um, I, I, I dealt, I've dealt with him a lot through the years. I mean, that story is 1991. So that was a while ago. Yeah. How about some of the other coaches in the Big East when, when it started, right? Because that's that's a just a Hall of Fame list of coaches. Unbelievable list of coaches. And, uh, of course, I covered John Thompson. Yep. Uh, and, and we fought like cats um, <laughs> because John was as secretive as any coach I've ever dealt with. And, of course, my job was to get through that veil of secrecy. And when Patrick Ewing was a junior, the year they won the national championship, I was doing a very long profile on him for the Washington Post. And I was actually granted an audience with Patrick, which was very unusual. Mm -hmm. And I yep. still had some follow-up questions after I talked to him. So I went to a game the next night and Georgetown won. Uh, they didn't lose very much in those days. And John was walking out of the locker room with his alter ego, Mary Fenlon, who was the mm -hmm. academic coordinator the whole Academics. time there. And, and, and his very close friend. And they, walk, they, they would always walk out together to go to the interview room. And as they walked out, I said, John, when you're done in the interview room, can I grab you for about five minutes? And before John could answer, Mary said, he doesn't have time to talk to you. Mary didn't like the media in general. She, liked, she disliked me even more. And I looked at her and I said, you know, Mary, I, I thought I was talking to John. I didn't realize I was talking to you. Ooh. And Ooh. John... I can't he go over himself well. up to his full height. He looked like he was about eight feet tall at that moment. <laughs> and he said, let me tell you something. He used his favorite word, which I'm sure you guys know. And oh, yeah. half of it is mother. Um, let me tell you something, <laughs> mother blind. Uh, if you're talking to me, you're talking to Mary. If you're talking to Mary, you're talking to me. If you're messing with Mary, you're messing with me. If you want to mess with me, mother blind. So I was 24 years old and stupid. And I said, you know, John, Everything I heard about you was when you played, you were nothing but a soft jump shooter. Oh. <laughs> and and oh. so why don't we go outside? And, you know, if, if what I've heard is true, I'll kick your butt. If what I've heard isn't true, you'll kick my butt. But let's go outside. And thank God, John started laughing. <laughs> put his arm around me. So let me he tell respected you, you now. Yeah. He oh. said, let me tell you something, Mother Blank. I don't like you. I don't like you one bit. But I respect your ass. I was going to say, absolutely. So I'll great. talk to you after, after we're that done. That is great. Didn't kill me. Um, <laughs> and we ended up becoming very close in, in, in his latter years. In fact, I wrote a book on race and sports a couple of years ago, and I co-dedicated it to John because he taught me so much about 
wow. race and what it's like to be black. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, there was Roly, and I love Roly. Uh, as I said to you, Chuck, before we started, uh, I, I, I was on the plane when you guys won the national championship back to Philly because Roly asked me to be on the plane or told me to be on the plane. Roly never right. asked anything. <laughs> um, but we, we used to fight. We used to fight too when I first got to know him. He used to always say to me, You don't have to be Jewish to be a schmuck, but you're both. Um, and, and, but, but he, he was, he was so damn honest about things. And uh, I, I love the way he ran his teams. I, I sat in, in 88, when I was doing my second book, mm -hmm. um, I sat in on, on uh, pregame meals and mass uh, with the team. And I couldn't imagine having more fun on a game day uh, than it yeah. does meals. And, That's uh, full access right there. Yeah, yeah, it was. Roley was great about that. He, he really was. Uh, and uh, I, I, I loved him. And uh, he, was, he was great to me. I, we, you know, it, he, uh, he even quoted me after Villanova beat Arkansas in the first round of the tournament in 88. He talked about what a great coach Nolan Ryan was that day, um, which must have shocked Nolan Richardson. But uh, he said, he quoted, he said something about my friend, John Feinstein says, if you want to be in a sweet 16, you got to earn it. And we're going to earn it on, on Sunday. And, and they did and, and made it to the sweet 16 and made it to the elite eight that year before they lost Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Yeah. That was, a, that was Plansky's team. Plansky was a senior. That was that Plansky's year. team. Yes. It, yeah. it was a very fun team to be around. Yeah. Those guys, those guys are still real close too. I mean, it, that's how it is with his team. I would imagine that. Yes. Yeah. All right, so let's do this, John. I, I, we, we got a couple of books that we want to talk to you about. Give us your best one or two stories with, with some of these book titles and, and, and what went on with behind the scenes. And the one that fascinates me is I coached a bunch of little kids, you know, for years, my kids and stuff like that. And I, I've got um, storytelling skills. Let's say that like that, okay? Oh, yeah, so, I'll back that up, John. I'll, <laughs> I'll second so, it. So yeah, I was given, exactly. I was gifted your book and it was signed by all the kids. And they said, you know, maybe one day you'll tell a story about us kind of thing, you know? So I, I you know, talk about, talk about Red Arback and that group of guys, Lefty Drizel was there and you guys, what was it? A weekly lunch, right? Weekly that... lunch on Tuesdays. In fact, Chuck, we still have them. Really? Even, yeah. Even though Red's been gone now for 17 years, almost 17 years. Yeah. But I knew when he passed away in 2006, he loved those lunches. He loved the camaraderie of them. And I knew he'd want them to continue. And so a bunch of us who were part of the lunch still get together every Tuesday at a Chinese restaurant wow. at 11 o'clock because Red always insisted on eating at 11 so we could get to his card game by one o'clock <laughs> um, because that was income for him playing gin. Uh, but uh, I stumbled into, to let me tell you a story. Um, I, I actually, a friend of mine, Dan Shaughnessy from the Boston Globe, there it is. Thank you, Sonny. Is. Um, Deep plug. told me that when he asked Red about doing a book, Red had said to him, you know, um, he, uh, yeah, I'll do it. Just don't do to me what that jerk did to Bobby Knight. Because he and Bob were very close. And so Dan, of course, couldn't wait to tell me this. So a few years later, I was doing a local TV show here in Washington. And uh, they said, oh, it's good that you're here. Our, our other guest isn't here yet. And I said, who's the other guest? And, and they said, Red Auerbach. And I said, oh, boy. So Red comes walking in, and I walked over. I said, hey, Coach, John Feinstein. And Red goes, hey, John, it's great to see you. So I said, ah, he's 81. He doesn't remember who I am. So we sat down, and, of course, he lit a cigar in a non-smoking building. And uh, he said to me, <laughs> so how's your buddy? Said, Which buddy is that, Coach? He said, Bob, Bobby Knight. I said, uh, coach, uh, he, he, he doesn't like me very much. He said, oh, I know he hates you. And I said, yeah, but he doesn't hate you. He loves you. And he said, ah, that's just because I never wrote a book on him. Well, Jack Vance, who was the AD at George Washington had told me all about these lunches on Tuesdays. And so I had the thought if Red doesn't hate me, maybe I can go to one of the lunches and write a column about it. So I called Jack and he said, call Morgan Wooten because he and Morgan are very close. Get Morgan to ask him. Legend. And Morgan called me back and he said, uh, he said, Red says, come on ahead. So I went the next Tuesday. And of course it was great. Red told stories the whole time. And I wrote the column. 
And then Zhang, Red's brother, who was kind of the organizer, called me and said, you're welcome to come back anytime. So I started going every week. I, I, oh, wow. I fell in love with it. And eventually the guys started saying to me, John, somebody's got to write these stories down. You know, they need to be preserved. And I didn't want Red to think I was coming to the lunches because I was looking for a book. Right. So I was kind of hesitant. And finally, one day he turned to me, he said, are we going to do this book or not? <laughs> and I said, well, if you want to. And my favorite story, real quick, Chuck, is um, at lunch one day, um, Red used to always, Red loved to gig me about Krzyzewski um, because he turned the Celtics down in 1990. And he kept telling me that Tommy Amaker, who's now the Harvard coach, should have had a 15-year NBA career, but he didn't because Mike wouldn't let him shoot. Now, I watched Tommy play in high school. Tommy was the, maybe the best defensive guard I ever saw in yeah. college on the ball, um, but he really couldn't shoot, and that's why he never made it in the NBA, that and being only six feet tall. But uh, I would say, you know what, Red, he was a great college guard, You know, did amazing things at Duke, but... I just don't think he, he was a pro. So one day Red turns to Morgan Wooten and he says, Morgan, you, you coached against him in high school. What did you think? And Morgan goes, you couldn't guard him. Couldn't be stopped. I said, All right, guys, I just don't think so. So Rob Aides, uh, who I mentioned earlier, was sitting there. He said, John, this is the greatest NBA coach of all time. This is the greatest high school coach of all time. Do we have to get John Wooden here to convince you that you're wrong? <laughs> and I said, I give up. That's it. You got no shot then, you know, those, those are the best times, John. I, I, I can't tell you. We, we just spoke with Louis Conaseca uh, about a week ago Amazing. And, we, and we interviewed him for, I don't know, 40 or 45 minutes in his kitchen. And then we spent another hour and a half listening to stories from him. It was un unbelievable. I've got un a lot of people. Story, uh, unbelievable great. recall. And, yeah. and he, I mean, he's 96. He Eight. 98 98 now see I he, pick, he picks up everything you say he's yep. crystal his voice is low but his voice is crystal clear yeah I, I mean I, I was so amazed at how sharp he was in his short-term memory was spot on i was like wow he, he taught me how to curse in italian there you go <laughs> <laughs> among yeah. other things he and valvano actually Val curse in yeah. italian and order food that's you you can survive yeah well louis and, and roly could both order food there's no question <laughs> well about. There's some something to be said about that because there was a story that we talked about with Coach that the three of them, Louis, Jimmy V, and Coach Mass, all went to Italy, and Coach was supposed to interpret and and uh, and talk to everybody because the other two guys really didn't know Italian that well. He insisted, so he orders dinner, and the waiters come back with umbrellas. They had because <laughs> he he didn't have any idea what he was doing. <laughs> but I love that. So, story. So now that you mentioned Jimmy V, talk about the Legends Club with Coach K, Dean Smith, and Jim Valvano. Yeah, you know, as I wrote in the introduction of that book, Chuck, I wasn't born to write that book, but I lived it. I was covering the ACC for the Washington Post uh, throughout the 11 years that those three guys coached against each other uh, at North Carolina, North Carolina State, and Duke. I first met Jim and Mike um, at, at an old Mama Leone's lunch in New York when Jim was at Iona and Mike was at Army. And Duke came in, to, I, I was still in college, Duke came in to play Connecticut. Uh, and it was an excuse for me to go home to New York for a couple of days. And the funny thing about that was Duke Connecticut was the first game in the garden because there were two nondescript programs. The second game was Fordham and Rutgers. That was the big game. Yeah. Um, but I met Jim and Mike then and when I got to the post they were both young coaches who I could get on the phone fairly easily and so I got to know them both before they came to North Carolina and then it was amazing to watch how different their stories were Jimmy won the national championship in his third year Mike was almost fired in his third year most of the Duke boosters wanted Tom Butters the AD to fire him uh, and I, I spent so much time I probably spent more time with Dean Smith than any reporter even wow. though I went to Duke, as he would often say. Um, and I, I was with Jim. Jim used to hang out in his office after games because, like most coaches, he couldn't sleep. Um, and he would tell stories and, and make everybody laugh. And then everybody would go home and he would stretch out on his couch and say to me, OK, you're my therapist. What do I do with my life next? He was always looking for that next thing. 
after he won the national championship. And of course, cancer and the money that he has, the V Foundation has raised, turned out to be the next thing, uh, right. tragically for him, but miraculously for many others since then. And uh, I was with Krzyzewski um, after they lost the last game of his third season, 109-66 to Virginia. I was in a Denny's with him and several others at two o'clock in the morning. And one of the guys we were with, Tom Mickle, who was the SID, raised his water glass and said, here's to forgetting tonight. And Krzyzewski raised his water glass and said, here's to never blanket. Mm -hmm. Never forget. Yeah, it's just great. That's and just, Virginia, yeah. the next 16 times they played him. And when Duke won the national championship in 91, when I walked out on the court and put out my hand to congratulate him, kind of pulled me in and said, we've come a long way from the blank and Denny's, haven't we? So he never yeah. forgot that and has always given me Seminal great moment. Yeah. as a result. Right. Um, and so I actually came up with the idea for the book, sitting with Mike at a dinner where he was getting an award here in Washington, um, talking to him about Dean and Jim. We were just talking about his memories of Jim because he was with Jim. He was literally in the hospital room when Jim died. Yep, that's Not right. that close to Jim and his family. And about his rivalry with Dean and how he, he finally figured out that, that there, were, there were reasons why Dean was Dean. And as I was driving home that night, I said to myself, there's a book on the three of these guys and their rivalries and their friendships and everything that went on between them. And that's, that's what led to the legends club. Wow. That's unbelievable. I mean, I was in the building when he gave that speech, uh, when he gave the, you know, the never give up speech it was on, it wasn't a dry eye in the whole place. It was unbelievable. No, there wasn't. And, and, you know, the interesting thing about that night, there are many interesting things about that night, but both Mike and John Saunders, who was very close yep. to, to Jim did not think he was going to make it. Uh, to the building that night because he was literally lying under the covers in his bed in his hotel room in his tuxedo shivering just before they were supposed to leave to go to I don't even remember where the SVs were held at. yeah it was that it was at the uh, theater at Madison Square Garden it used there to be called the Felt Forum yeah. yeah the Felt Forum I remember it well Felt um, Forum I yeah. remember it uh, but anyway, uh, and, and, and when he when he came that you know when Mike and Dick Vitale helped him down the steps he sat down in his seat and he said to Pam, did I do okay? And, you know, he's getting a standing ovation and he, honey, you did great. And then he passed out. He literally passed out. He had nothing left in the tank. Wow. That's wow. Amazing. And died eight weeks later. Yeah. And I, I know that that was, that was terrible, but you know, the whole Jimmy V foundation has really uh, done wonderful wonderful things and raised millions and millions of dollars to help yeah, people it has been and and, and vital and shashevsky have both been key guys key guys yep yeah, exactly all right one or two more and then we'll get you out of here because i know you're running up against it you got another uh, appointment and we appreciate your time uh what about the uh back roads to march the lesser known uh, cinderellas that we talked that you talked about in that one that was one of my most fun books, Chuck, because especially nowadays when, uh, you know, big time basketball in terms of access isn't what it used to be. I still do pretty well with access because I've been around for 100 years. But um, to be, you know, to go to places like Army and Navy and Lafayette and Bucknell and all the different schools I went to, the big South schools, um, and, and talk again, talk to kids who had stories to tell. Um, there was one kid at Army uh, who ended up being the team captain and leading scorer who his senior year in high school, he was going to enlist in the Army. And uh, you know, Jimmy Allen, who was Army's coach at the time, saw him play and said, what are you thinking of doing? Well, I, I, coach, I think I'm going to enlist. And he said, well, why don't you come to Army, play basketball for four years and be an officer? And he did and ended up having a, a great career. And you know, you, you bump up against stories like that all the time. Chris Clemens, who was five foot nine, was the leading scorer in the country that year at Campbell, ended up as the third leading scorer all time in NCAA Division I. Uh, Griff Aldrich, who's the coach now at Longwood, who was a lawyer for 18 years, making a lot of money. I remember, I, yeah, I've heard the story. Yeah, go ahead. And he wanted to, wanted to coach. So Ryan Odom, his college uh, roommate, got the job at UMBC. And he called Ryan and Ryan said, well, I've got an opening for a director of basketball operations. I can pay you $32,000. That was about an $800,000 pay cut. 
Um, but he moved his wife and his three kids from Houston to Baltimore. And the second year they were there, of course, they pulled the Virginia upset, the famous yeah. Virginia upset. And then um, Griff got the Longwood job. And two years ago, got them into the tournament for the very first time. That's my daughter, Jane, behind me. So anyway, uh, you know, that, that book was just tremendous fun to do. And, and it was surprisingly successful because it came out right when the pandemic started. So all of my promotional stuff was canceled. But wow. people were stuck at home with no tournament to watch. So they bought the book. So <laughs> it ended up working out. Wow. That's great. That's great. Well, all right. So we're, get, we're up against it. You know, we want to, um, we want to uh, respect your time constraints and everything, John. So what would you tell a youngster, a young kid that wants to go into journalism as a major now? I mean, it's a little different now than when you, there's no newspaper men anymore. There's a lot of digital stuff. Everything's online and everything is two seconds, two seconds, just to keep, you know, there's nobody's got their, you know, focus anymore on, on things. What would you tell a kid that wants to get into journalism? Well, I'm biased, as you know, Chuck, because I yeah. am a newspaper guy. Um, and I still believe in print journalism, no matter what form <coughs> it comes in, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and so what I do tell kids is learn how to be a reporter. Not, not even just a sports reporter. I mean, as I said, I started as a night police reporter at the Washington Post, and God knows I learned so much um, from those. I spent four years in news altogether, covering courts, cops, politics, a little bit of everything. Um, I'd say become a reporter, learn how to report. Because even if your ultimate dream, and I know these days, you know, when I was in college, the ultimate dream was to work for the Washington Post or the New York Times. Now it's to work for ESPN. And we've had a lot of people come through the post and leave the post to go to ESPN. Um, and I said, even if that's your ultimate goal, the more you can do as a reporter and as a writer, the better off you're going to be, regardless of where you're working. And um, I, I still believe in, in the printed word. And I think it's important. And whether it's in book form, whether it's in magazine form, newspaper form, or digital form. And I, and when I see talented kids who say, oh, I want to be in television, I, honestly, I find that very disappointing because to me, anybody can do television. I've done television and, sure. you know, you, you, you can talk about almost anything for 30 seconds. Ask me any subject. I can talk for 30 seconds sure. uh, or I can read a teleprompter. Um, and but those guys make a hell of a lot of money. I mean, my friends, Mike Wilbon and Tony Kornheiser are a ri lot richer than I am. Um, <laughs> But I, I love doing what I do, and I wouldn't trade it for anything. Yeah. I mean, that's that's about says it all. That's what a great that's, way to wrap this up today. That's the passion wow. you just talked about your dad has. That's what you got. I hear I you. Do, I, I, I'm lucky that I still <laughs> feel passionate about what I do. I've often said, Sonny, and I believe this, and this was true with the Faraday book, no doubt, that I get paid to do things most people would pay to do. Yeah. Yeah, it comes out of your pores. It's it's easy to see, you know. Yeah. You feel it. Yeah, it, yeah, it's great. So you mentioned it. Let's mention it again. The Faraday book is out now. It's your forty eighth book, correct? Yes, it is. All right. So the forty eighth John Feinstein book, Faraday, is out now. And where can we get that, John? Online? Get it anywhere, Chuck. Amazon.com, BarnesandNoble.com, in bookstores. I always encourage people to go to bookstores. Yeah. They need help. There's still um, a few of them left. That, there you know, are I, still a yeah. few of them left. There's some great independent Barnes & Noble, Barnes and Noble yep. still going. Um, but you can get it, you can get it any place. Well, thank you very, very much for joining us. I wish we had more time. We have to have you back so we can hear more stories, John. That was, that <laughs> Just was ask. I'll be glad to do it. Absolutely. Thank you. Our, our guest today has been John Feinstein, and this has been the Big East Rewind. The Big East Rewind is brought to you by Daryl Chico Chorus and Nick, oh, <laughs> Daryl Gurney and Nick Chico Chorus. I got everything screwed up. Oh, Daryl Gurney and Nick Chico Chorus, produced and directed by. And you can find us on all things social media by putting Big East Rewind in the search bar. We're uh, on YouTube. Just go in and put Big East Rewind in the in the search bar, and all of our shows will come up. Thanks a lot for joining us. Have a great night. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Have a good one. <laughs>